Thank you everyone for um, having me here today. Uh, I'm a neuroradiologist, so I, I, I learned a lot uh, in regards to surgical uh, interventions uh, for KRE1. Um, just go. And the study, we, we uh, Jerry and I conducted this study because uh, we do a lot of imaging. And, uh, and as you guys all know, it's for uh, it's, uh, the workhorse for delineating an anatomy, looking for syrinx, resolution of um, Sy syringes and uh, looking for flow voids and there's a lot of ways that we use imaging as a roadmap, a guide or, or a surveillance tool and uh, and it's great um, and but in cases where it requires repeated imaging on children we do kind of wonder about the issues of just how to get them into the scanner, especially in pediatric setting. A lot of times requires, um, you know, just um, anesthesia, sedation issues, just a lot of logistics, and there's cost involved as well. And so in the community, as you guys all know, FASTSCAN is pretty routinely done now to minimize radiation exposure and to make imaging a little bit more accessible for folks who just need repeat imaging. And it's been well described for hydrocephalus, cyst follow-up, and even trauma. But uh, as, as of now, and this is an example of a fast scan, you can kind of see mother's kind of fingers wrapped around the baby's or the child's head. But in the Chiari realm, we haven't really explored its potential use. And again, here are some examples, follow-up of uh, some subdural here. Um, you guys can see, and here's a kid with shunt failure. You can see this fluid collection right out there. So we thought, gosh, you know, we should, we have a ton of uh, fast brain uh, MR data sitting in our database, and we know a bunch of kids had Chiari, so let's just kind of see if there's a role for this and make it a little bit easier for patients to come and get scanned, whether it's for surveillance, initial diagnosis, or post-op resolution. So that's what we did, and again, here's an example of a kid who kind of has this little uh, dysmorphic, but uh, has sort of this dysmorphic appearance right at the craniocervical junction and a two-year-old. So typically a child like this who comes in for a brain and spine scan, that's over an hour exam, uh, prep the kid, sedate, you know, GA, all those issues, and after we scan the kid, then they go to the recovery or whatever the, you know, the monitoring area. So it becomes like a big ordeal. So that's sort of what, what got us interested. And so again, the, the whole, uh, the, the, the goal, to see is there a role for fast scan, which many of you guys do, whether it's, uh, if you use Siemens magnet, it's a haste, if it's GE, we do just basic single shot fast spin echo, and it just sort of depends on the vendor. Um, so we kind of, between 2014 and 2012, or 17, we looked at over 300 kids and went through every single one of them, and we kind of identified who had Chiari of some sort, whether it was initial diagnosis or or I should say prior uh, to surgery or post-op setting. Uh, but again, they weren't done for Chiari purpose, so that's, not, that's why we don't have a huge end. They were done for other reasons, for instance, ventricular, ventricular megaly or dysmorphic features or something. Um, something with regards to uh, cyst or uh, shunt type of thing. But within this group, we identified the ones that had abnormal tonsillar configuration or low-lying tonsils and as defined by lower than five millimeters um, below craniocervical or sort of below foramen magnum. And uh, we, had a, we found about 18 kids um, and 30 controls. And uh, they all had uh, three plane fast spin echo uh, single shot images, uh, which are very fast, are about 20, 30 seconds each. Um, and we identified a cohort within this cohort who also had a conventional regular standard of care uh, MRI um, with T2 imaging uh, within a year and without necessarily an uh, intervention in between. So we kind of had some sort of a goal, sort of a comparison, although it's not perfect comparison, because in a perfect world, what you want to do is fast scan plus the regular brain all at one, you know, same time, but of course that's not feasible. But, but again, this is what we had. This is retrospective data. And so what we did was we pulled all these scans, we kind of randomized it, and blinded two neuroradiology fellows who are now uh, attendings, actually. Um, and uh, normally, the fast scans are done for some basic things, right? Looking for cyst or big ventricles or um, hemorrhage or something like that. Big hemorrhages, not little ones. So we gave all this multiple choices, had them kind of figure out what they thought they saw, 
and then uh, we, you know, and then the tonsils were low, etc. And then we also had a second uh, run where we again blinded all the people. And in the cases with Chiari one, as defined by the gold standard uh, traditional MR, the full MR, uh, we had the reviewers measure, do all kinds of, I mean, do the tonsillar measurement and and things like that. And on both the regular T2 MR as well as the fast sequence, so we had those guys do it. And overall, um, they were very good at identifying low-lying tonsils on fast scan. Um, there was a pretty good inter-rater agreement. Um, you, you, can, you can see these are all examples of the fast scan that we acquired. You can kind of actually get a nice anatomic uh, uh, look at that area. And you can even see syrinx syrin in some of these kids. Also, with regards to the measurement um, between the fast scan and a T2, there was, they were very good at, they were very concordant. The measurements were pretty, pretty good within each reviewer, and uh, the reviewer themselves, between the two reviewers, they were also pretty, they showed pretty good agreement. We ran some Pearson uh, correlation coefficients here. So we thought, wow, this is encouraging. Maybe next time we have a Chiari kid coming back for um, you know, post-decompression or just even surveillance, maybe we can just do the FAST scan. So I wanted to show you guys at our institution what Jerry and I worked out with our uh, radiology team was try to provide this FAST scan at a more cost-effective, a, a little bit better cost for the patients. And you can kind of see what a, a you know, full MR can take up to an hour and again, a lot of that has to, even if these are non-con scans, of course, they're not fancy with contrast, et cetera, but um, because, you know, you have to get them prepped and do the localizer, do the, I don't know, you gotta wheel them in. There's all this, this other time issue. So it takes about an hour to get the whole thing done on average. This is what we calculated after adding all up. Average time for the fast scan is about 15 minutes. So you can kind of see that it's, it's, it could be patient friendly, right? Little kids coming in, you don't want to be in the scanner for that long. And the cost for the fast was we negotiated with our hospital to, because it's not a full diagnostic scan, can we get it at a reasonable price? You can kind of see a non-constant, you being fairly expensive, and I don't know how it is at your institutions, but at least at ours, and this was a few years ago, maybe a year or two, um, it was at $8,000 plus dollars for a non-con brain. That's kind of expensive. And a non-con head being over $5,000. And of course, this is not even counting the anesthesia cost, right? And the hospital medication, etc. Recovery room monitoring. So though those are extras. So we thought this could be something that we could all kind of use, you know, think about using down the line and considering, you know, not every hospital is a little different. Initially, our folks were a little resistant to doing this because we showed uh, literature showing we've we do fast scan for hydrocephalus workup, shunt failures, et cetera. Can we do it for this? And there was a lot of resistance. So that's what got us motivated to publish this, that maybe it is, it could be, we could look for um, tonsillar anatomy using fast scan, and maybe this could be incorporated as part of our clinical indications, and therefore the patients are eligible to get the cost-effective uh, scan. Um, and none of our uh, kids who had fast scan uh, had to convert because they were considered non diagnostic had to convert to a full GA study. So that's sort of our experience. And here are some clinical vignettes I want to show you guys. Here's an example of a kid with Cruzon syndrome, had shunted hydrocephalus. That's why he came and got this uh, FAST scan. And you can kind of see the morphologic delineation is pretty darn good. You can do a little measurement here, do your little measurement there. And granted, our traditional T2 FSC or T2 cube or whatever have you, generally are good, occasionally, and I don't know if it has something to do with the fact that with the uh, abnormal tonsillar morphology and alteration of uh, CSF uh, dynamics right in that area, you do get these pulsation CSF artifacts that sometimes, not all the time, could hamper delineation where the tonsils are. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll look at the T1 and do other things to do the measurement. But again, this is one thing we notice as potential benefit to the fast scan. There's less of this flow artifact, uh, which could be a benefit, but also it could be a negative, especially if you're looking at uh, fast scan for other um, hydrocephalus follow-up, right? Because sometimes you might be looking for that CSF jet at the third ventriculostomy site that we like to to, to look for uh, to look for patency. But in the case of this. The, the fact that in the fast scan, the single shots, that, that there's less uh, CSF pulsation artifact could be a benefit if you're looking at the more, a better anatomic delineation. 
So there's another kid, um, post uh, decompression after. Um, you can actually see the series is pretty well visualized. We thought that was kind of nice. We hadn't now done a fast scan for spine, but we do want to do that next. And I know Jerry has organized some things with our department, so we can now start doing fast spines, and not just the brains. Um, but you can also see there's some extra um, CSF pulsation artifacts, see all that black stuff. Um, again, less uh, dominant on the fast scan. Uh, here's another kid, post decompression. Um, this is fast scan, this was the one from, I think, before. And this is, uh, you can kind of see the, the syrinxes are a little bit, a little bit, maybe not as big, you know, maybe a little smaller. Um, but again, uh, just again, the, the, the syrinxes can be visualized also. So we want to actually bring uh, spine, fast spine, spine also for the, these kids, especially if we're trying to monitor these uh, changes in syrinx size. But going further, so we have some other ideas coming up down the pipeline, and hopefully I can share with you guys next time around. Um, so, um, so we kind of explored fast MRI as a potential potential alternative to conventional regular, you know, the regular five or four minute MRI for KRE1 uh, per sequence. I mean, uh, can we use fast spine for series? And I think you can. That's my thought. Just like looking for cyst. Now, um, can we do even better image quality for fast scan? And so this is something I'm working on with our physicists. Some of our prelim data I'm gonna show you in just a second. Uh, and of, of note, the, often the conventional single shot fast spin echo that we use for fast scan has kind of poor quality. You might notice that the images look flat. You don't see ni nice gray white differentiation, low tissue contrast, images look blurred. But can we do some manipulations at the acquisition side to make it better and even faster? So one of the things that we're exploring uh, is that we can use a variable reco refocusing flip angles um, for improved image quality and even faster scan times. So I'm gonna show you some prelim data, which I haven't published yet, but we will shortly. Um, so this is our conventional uh, fast MR. It looks kind of flat. Uh, we do some variable flip angles. You can start seeing gray-white a little bit better. Here's another example, just a conventional stuff. You do some change in the uh, refocusing uh, flip angle, and you can kind of, this one starts to look like the real T2 image, you know, the conventional thing we use day to day that's more along the lines of, you know, three, four, five minutes, depending on the magnet strength. Um, so these are things we're exploring. They're also much, much faster than even the, um, the fast scans. So it, we're talking uh, half the time in, in, in these instances. You can see that this is a traditional single shot fast spin echo fast scan at uh, 13 or 1100 milliseconds. You can have it, at, you know, make it half. So that's kind of encouraging. Um, so that makes it less uh, sensitive to motion, just the fact that you're a little faster. So these are things that we're cooking right now. We hope to um, see if that fares well with our carry kids and other kids too who require um, fast scan. And, um, and one other thing, again, uh, some of the basic science physics work we've explored, are there other roles for imaging, um, you know, in, for carry evaluation, one evaluation? And uh, I know there's people who've done, you know, perfusion and diffu DTI and diffusion, and we kind of want to do that too. But here's something that we, were inspired uh, over, I don't remember, dinner or some beer or something. <laughs> we, started, we watched this YouTube video, and I guess um, what it is is uh, there's a whole bunch of these things where there are subtle, um, you know, when you watch a video, things that seem static, there are subtle, like, variations of movement that, that can be captured. And so the MIT students or guys kind of looked at these and said, we could write a, an algorithm or a code to try to amplify the subtle variations in a video form. So here's an example of uh, what they did, was this is the original input uh, of the video. And they, um, they were able to use this code to amplify um, uh, visualize human pulse, right? And, uh, and so the same frames with the subject's pulsing, you know, signal is amplified. And I don't, you know, I don't know exactly how it's done, but they can kind of uh, try to look at the color variation. So I guess when the pulse is going up your head, you look a little more red. But of course, this is exaggerated, right? So it's not. So this is just to bring that out. We thought that's pretty cool. And they did this for other things like 
air moving through the like atmosphere or like there's a whole bunch of these you can go to the website I I have it listed and you can kind of go through every different things you can amplify and they even have a code so if one of any of you guys are computer scientists you can actually import this code and start writing your own code so we thought oh that sounds really cool can we do that for our kids? <laughs> so, so we go, okay, so we started working with our physicists, um, at basic, uh, basic science lab, and we thought, well, is there any way we can exaggerate the brain motion if we cardiac gate our MRI and, uh, and, and have a dynamic sequence acquisition, and so we can kind of exaggerate brain motion. And so, um, and we thought, okay, cardiac function, you know, it'll, again, it goes back to heart, right? So we're brain and heart. So, um, so can we try to exaggerate what could be very barely perceptible brain motion and try to visualize biomechanical um, response of changes in tissue, etc., using heartbeat as your endogenous mechanical driver? And so this is sort of what we did. Um, these are some of our volunteers, I think, our grad students. Um, and so they, what they used, uh, the MIT guys used what's called a Eulerian video magnification. So we used, we kind of took their code and kind of wrote our own code um, to amplify subtle spatial variations. Of course, this requires you to obtain a, uh, um, like a dynamic MR and uh, cardiac gait as well. So it requires a little bit of training, so we kind of sat down with our uh, MRI technologists and had them cardiac gait and did a little training. Sometimes we failed, sometimes we didn't. But you can kind of see that you could exaggerate, like what is imperceptible. There is some brain uh, motion that could be interesting to look at in the future, which I think could be very interesting in our Chiari kids. Um, here's another example. Um, we did change different, uh, how does brain motion look at different harmonic bands, and we calculated that for you know each voxel over time. Again, you know we don't know if it uh, would be useful for our Chiari children, but if there's interest in biomechanical changes, this might be something to look at. So this is just a pre uh, prelim data. We looked at some normal kids and Chiari 1 kids, and, and we gen tried to generate a little bit of heat map, and there seems to be a lot of motion here. And I don't know if things are moving down a little bit there, and even in the supratentorial brain, which we think was kind of interesting. But again, this needs to be done in a in a uh, organized fashion. I think it'd be really good to look at the pre and post decompression kids. It'd be really nice to look at the kids who have symptoms versus not. And so again, a lot of this, this, this work is you know something that we could explore. Uh, but I just wanted to share with you guys what we are trying to cook um, and. Uh, uh, with Jerry and other folks uh, at Stanford, and this is our team. We have physicists and um, a lot of neurosurgeons working together with us and students and residents. So thank you for your attention. Thank you.